Please join me in welcoming Carrie Escal. Thank you. I'm going to focus on two areas which might seem unrelated, cryptography and RLD RAM. In fact, they have a number of things in common. Both are case studies of how some innovative design tools were used to create IP quickly. And both technologies are destined to play a major role in communications and networking. We'll begin by examining the process used to migrate a new cryptographic algorithm directly into an FPGA by using a hardware-related extension of NCC called Handle C. Two months ago, a federal mandate went into effect, which was the last official step in retiring the old data encryption standard, DES, and replacing it with a new, more robust algorithm called AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Because cryptography is at the intersection of mathematics, communications, information theory, and intrigue, its development through the ages is fascinating. So I thought I'd share a little cryptographic history before discussing the details of implementing AES. After all, it took two and a half thousand years to get here. One of the earliest encryption systems was the Cytalee. The Cytalee consisted of a long, thin strip of leather or parchment wrapped tightly around a cylinder. After a message was written across it, the strip was unwound and sent on its way. At the receiving end, the strip had to be rewound around another cylinder of the same size and shape to read the message back. Now, at first glance, the Cytalee might seem primitive, but it was a huge advance and far more humane than the prevailing technology, which entailed shaving the head of a slave, carving a message on his skull, waiting for the hair to grow back, and setting him off to find the recipient. And as you can imagine, another drawback was probably pipeline latency. About 400 years later, Julius Caesar described a system he invented, known today as a Caesar cipher or a Caesar shift. He encoded messages to his legions by taking each letter of the text and replacing it with a letter shifted three positions to the right in the alphabet. Techniques like this are known as monoalphabetic substitution ciphers because each given letter of the text is always replaced by the same corresponding letter of cipher text. That preserves letter frequency, of course, so it's easy to decipher the message using letter frequency analysis. For example, in English, the most common letter is E at 13%. And if anyone ever asks you in Latin, it's I at 12%. Interestingly, when, August, when the Caesar's nephew, Augustus, came into power, he's rumored to have changed it to a one-letter shift after complaining that three letters were too difficult to comprehend. Cryptography really began to evolve during the Middle Ages. Even the word cipher came into use about that time when the concept of zero was introduced. Most people thought the uh, whole idea of zero was very confusing. So eventually, the original word for zero, cipher, from the Arabic cipher, became synonymous with an attempt to confuse. Blaise de Vigenier invented a polyalphabetic substitution cipher in 1585. The Vigenier square is essentially a Caesar shift, except that the amount of shift varies letter by letter according to each letter of a keyword. For the next 300 years, the Vigenier square was considered absolutely unbreakable until it was broken by Charles Babbage while tinkering with one of his prototypes. Thomas Jefferson built an encryption system out of 26 wooden wheels to keep America's first secrets secret. And finally, one of the reasons that the advanced encryption standard is available to us today as C source code stems from this article on military cryptography published by Auguste Kirchhoff in 1883. In it, Kirchhoff outlines his six principles, and I'll paraphrase one that the security of a good cipher should rely upon the security of the key, not the algorithm. In other words, the algorithm could safely survive falling into the hands of the enemy or the public domain. This is a good time to talk about some common terminology in modern cryptography. Block ciphers encrypt a given number of bits of plain text into the same number of bits of cipher text. Symmetric key algorithms use the same key for encryption and decryption, as opposed to asymmetric algorithms like those used for public key encryption. Most block ciphers are iterative, meaning that the algorithm encrypts or decrypts a block by applying a series of round transformations. A round transformation is a Boolean substitution, permutation, or nonlinear transformation that helps to obscure the data statistically. Each application of a round transformation is called a round. The point to keep in mind is that iterative block ciphers have to apply a number of rounds to encrypt a block. 
1977, the National Institute of Standards and Technology introduced the data encryption standard, DES. DES is a symmetrical iterative block cipher operating on 64-bit blocks and using a 56-bit key. It takes 16 rounds to encrypt or decrypt a block. One of the assumptions made at that time is that it would be computationally cost prohibitive to do an exhaustive search for a 56-bit key. Just to be on the safe side, NIST mandated that the DES standard be reviewed and renewed every five years. So it was reviewed and renewed and reviewed and renewed until in the late 90s, DES was compromised. This machine, built by Paul Kotcher, used 1800 ASICs to find a DES key in just 56 hours. DES also has come to massive parallel processing over the internet, as well as uh, being weakened to a certain extent by advances in linear and differential cryptoanalysis. As a stopgap, triple DES was introduced. This is the EDE configuration, where the first and last blocks in the chain perform encryption, and the center block operates in decrypt mode. It's done that way for backwards compatibility. If all three keys are set the same, it is the same as a single DES unit. For decryption, the operation is inverted. In other words, decrypt, encrypt, decrypt. Xilinx's Vertex 2 family of FPGAs, for example, have built-in on-chip DED decryption units to keep their configuration data secure. But in a communication system where you need to encrypt in real time, triple DES is often slow, large, or both. So in 1997, NIST made an open solicitation for a replacement algorithm to be called AES. The candidate algorithms were evaluated based on security, which is their resistance to attack, cost of implementation and hardware software, which really translates to performance, would require a high-end processor, would it use a lot of expensive memory, versatility, how easy would it be to port that algorithm to, say, a 8-bit or 4-bit microcontroller embedded in a smart card? And key agility. Key agility is important in networking. In a system where you had a single channel of traffic secured by AES, the key might not change very often. But when a number of channels share the same encryption engine, there's a certain overhead associated with loading and unloading the key states for each of the channels. So low key agility becomes a bottleneck. Additionally, this would have to be a symmetrical block cipher operating on 128-bit blocks and giving the user an option of 128, 192, or 256-bit keys, very large. And remember Kirchhoff's principle? An additional requirement is this algorithm be made available worldwide, royalty-free, and provided an ANSI C reference code. Fifteen algorithms from around the world entered the cryptographic survivor game. And in late 2000, NIST announced the winner, pronounced Reindahl. Reindahl was developed by two well-known Belgian cryptographers, Vincent Reimann and Jon Damen. It can encrypt a 128-bit block using a 128-bit key in just 10 rounds. Contrast that with DES, which takes 16 rounds to encrypt a 64-bit block with just a 56-bit key. Ryandel can actually accommodate variable block sizes and use a number of different keys. AES is just a special case of Ryandel being constrained to 128-bit blocks and one of those three key sizes. If you had a machine that could find a DES key in one second, it would take 149 trillion years to find the smallest AES key. So being a bit conservative, NIST estimates AES will probably last about 20 years. Here's how Reindahl works. To encrypt a block, there's a little housekeeping done, where subkeys for each round and the input data are placed in four by four matrices. For each round except the last, there are four steps. A byte substitution, which is basically a byte level nonlinear transformation. A shift row that moves the data over the matrix. Mixed column, which is a matrix multiplication of each column against a fixed polynomial as a Galois field. And finally, a simple XOR addition of the sub-round key into that state of the round. Those operations repeat 10 times for 128-bit key, 12 times for 192-bit key, and 14 times for 256-bit key. But it's really a little easier to implement than that. The first stage, byte substitution, could be implemented as a uh, lookup table. And shift row and add round key are trivial. It's that third stage, mixed column, that needs a little bit of attention. 
Here is the original reference code for AES as provided in C. We're looking at the MixCom procedure in Microsoft's Visual C++ IDE. Now suppose the product you're designing has to comply with a federal specification. The AES source code is readily available in C. As a matter of fact, to put it up on our web page. But you need to encrypt data fast. So the best place to run this algorithm is in a high-speed FPGA, not a processor. What's the best way to implement that IP quickly and with minimal risk? That's where Soloxica comes in. Soloxica's tool is based on a language called Handle C. Handle C is a hardware-related extension of ANSI C that directly generates EDIF. It's used to close the gap between rapid software development in C and high-speed implementation of that code on an FPGA. We'll take another look at the reference code, this time in the Soloxica IDE, which looks a lot like the Microsoft IDE. Same portion of code, the MixCom procedure. The first step in the port is to declare the MixCom procedure as a macro procedure, which basically just instantiates it as inline code. Without any optimization, performance is 80 clocks per round. That's very slow, because it's going to take 10 rounds to encrypt with a 128-bit key. So let's begin optimizing. Most of the time in the MixCom procedure is spent doing matrix multiplication, using a single multiplier and nested i and j loops to index into the 4x4 array. By enclosing that code in brackets and inserting the power directive, the loops are enrolled and 16 parallel multipliers are built. As a result, one round per clock. We'll take it a step further. Now, all 10 rounds will be done in the same clock. We'll use power to do the input stage and first round, the next eight rounds, and the last round and output stage. As a result, one AES block is encrypted each clock. That translates to six gigabits per second throughput in a vertex E, and 8.4 gigabits per second throughput using a vertex 2 in the same speed grade. Last step is validation. We're still in the C environment, so it's easy to call the NIST provided test vectors off of disk and call the AES code we just wrote as a procedure. Although the performance is very impressive, 8.4 gigabits per second throughput, the real value of handle C is time to market. The entire process of taking this algorithm and migrating it into an FPGA took about a week. In this case, we used Handle C to react quickly to a new market requirement and minimize risk by building our IP off of the standard available reference code. But wherever there is a traditional processor or DSP in a critical path, and that processor is, is executing a complex algorithm that needs to be accelerated, the combination of Handle C and a fast FPGA is very enticing. Other critical paths in networking often involve packet classification and packet buffering. Handle C can't help us there, because the timing is generally constrained by the cost and performance of the memory devices themselves. A new memory architecture is finding its way in those applications, called reduced latency DRAM. Not everyone is aware of RL DRAM yet, so Abnet Design Services, Infineon, Micron and Denali partnered to create an RLDRAM reference design in a Vertex 2. RLDRAMs provide the high speed random access necessary for packet classification with the high sustained bandwidth necessary for packet buffering. They combine the best features of static RAM with the bandwidth, cost, and density advantages of double data rate DRAM. But there are some important differences when comparing the two. RL DRMs have double the data width and operate at double the DDR clock rate, so bandwidth is four times greater. Growth cycle time is as low as 25 nanoseconds, allowing for very fast random access. Since they're built with eight internal memories, eight internal memory banks, typically organized as eight banks of one meg by 32, it's possible to sustain a very high bandwidth by using cyclical bank switching. And from an ease of use standpoint, there's no clock turnaround needed, and addressing is done with simple non-multiplexed inputs. On the downside, 
uh, RLDRMs do cost more than DDRs because they don't target or track the commodity PC market. To bring these benefits to a wider audience, we designed an RLDRM controller and placed it in a Vertex 2 FPGA, and then built a reference design around it. We took advantage of a concurrent design flow. A set of Advent engineers in Phoenix designed the hardware, while another set of Advent engineers in our Boston Design Center created the IP for the controller. To create that IP, they had to specify the performance and data path requirements of the controller, characterize the RLDRAM memory device, write the code, and model the controller and the memory together as a subsystem. All of those functions were provided in the same design environment by a memory controller design tool from Denali called Databond. Databond has a device database called Soma. The Soma database has a timing characterization, features and functionality of 4,000 memory components. But this is actually the first time that Databond had been used outside of the ASIC world. So there still was a substantial investment by the design teams to uh, develop the clocking strategy, to exploit the DCMs, and to do floor planning. This is what the tool looks like. On the left side is part of the template used to specify the basic controller functionality. As you can see from the drop-down box, Denali's Databond supports a number of different memory technologies. On the right side is part of the screen used to specify the memory system itself. To support the very high sustained bandwidth through cyclical bank switching, address order was specified as chip select, then row, then memory bank. Performance analysis can be scenario-based. This is part of a script for pattern that pings the same memory bank continuously, which is worst case for an RLDRAM. The pattern could easily be one that models a particular traffic flow of interest. The performance analysis is then delivered for the entire system under those conditions. Finally, the finished product, the RLDRAM reference design. In addition to the 2V1000, the RLDRAM controller is positioned next to a programmable memory analyzer that exercises the unit, and that's interfaced to a UART. It eases integration a bit. Two 256 megabit DRAMs operate at a 400 megahertz DDR rate to deliver 1.6 gigabytes per second throughput. The two tall white connectors on the right side of the board are the AVBUS interface. The AVBUS interface allows this board to snap onto some of the other AVNET development boards and systems, such as the Vertex 2 development system, and the top board, which is a PowerPC-based communications processor board that runs embedded Linux. To learn more about these boards, the RLDRAM reference controller, or handle C, please talk to one of the AVNET engineers in the room. In some locations, we also have these boards up and running for demonstration. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about AES or cryptography in general, I've put some additional resources and references up on this web page. Thank you.